Welcome to 24 Karis. I'm Kelly Johnson, the founder of Karis by KJE. Uh, we are in yet another aspect, another part of our series talking about employee resource groups. If you've missed the other two, go back and listen. Um, but Tony and Cortland from Bell, um, the Bang ERG are here with us sharing their wisdom, their lessons learned, and we're going to continue that conversation today. Thanks again for being here. Thanks for having us. All right. So, uh, the conversation has been so rich and uh, you all, I think, just really model uh, leadership, which is why we wanted to have you on the show. So thank you for everything that you're doing incrementally above and beyond to give back to Bell, but also even even beyond Bell. So thank you for that. We really appreciate it. Um, I want to talk about one of the benefits that um, as DEI leaders, we often kind of sell organizations who are on the fence about starting ERGs is that it's a great way to, to kind of support personal development. Mm -hmm. Has that been true for you all? And if so, how? Yeah, absolutely. Go, yeah, go ahead. I, I'll, I'll take it first. <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's been a, a, a wonderful chance to personally develop um, both myself, my brand, um, everything that entails being an employee at an organization. Uh, personally, I just love the opportunity it's given for me to practice my servant leadership. Um, at the end of the day, I was voted to be the leader of this organization, but it's not about where I want to take the organization. It's, it's truly about what is the organization telling me it needs and how can I, how can I you know, affect a, a strategy that allows us to, to go in that direction. Um, personally, I love leading teams. I love working with people. I love meeting different personalities. So it's always been one of my personal goals to be better at that, mm -hmm. to make sure that when I'm leading a team, I'm not just, I'm not managing people. I hate when people use that, that term. I'm truly finding out what makes them tick and how can I make them better? How can I make the people under me more successful um, and challenging them in ways that they would not have done <laughs> otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's given me a chance to really, you know, look at, for instance, my board and figure out, all right, what do y'all need as far as skills? What are, you, what are you trying to get better at? Mm -hmm. What would you like to specialize in? And then challenge them with stretch opportunities that I think can help them further their career. Uh, luckily, I've had the chance to you know, directly affect that with two of my board members, <laughs> yeah. one sitting right here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the, uh, the future co-chair, well, now she's the current co-chair in my place. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them have gotten new career, uh, new jobs yes. based on you know, what they've done in the ERG and, and me being able to advocate in a space for them. Um, yeah. Being a leader as an ERG has given me a lot of cachet, a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with uh, executive leadership. And through those connections, I was actually able to put forth their names mm -hmm. uh, on, on sh very short lists to get them into new positions. Mm -hmm. Worked out well for them. We got, yeah. got them there. And we did it. You're two for two. <laughs> two for two. <laughs> I am, I am, three for three if we count yeah, myself. Three for three. <laughs> three, for three. Um, That's awesome. So I, I really think that uh, being, a, being in an organization allows you to develop not just those skills, develop what you want to do, but also when you think about how it translates into the business. Mm -hmm. Running an ERG is running a budget. It's mm -hmm. running a schedule. It's program management. Oh, it's yeah. figuring out how to do more with less, which I think is an increasingly important skill in today's world, uh, especially in our world at Bell. We're yeah. always challenging yeah. our finances. So um, whenever I can, I'm trying to do more with less. And I think that's been a, a wonderful skill I've been able to generate. Yeah, so uh, Corlin's being humble about it, but he's a, he's excellent at all those things. <laughs> Even from the time that I that I joined the board, um, just consistently pushing, and it's an iron type and a sharp as iron situation. So I've learned so much from him immensely. And as he as he talked about, uh, there are roles and opportunities that I may not have had visibility to that I was both prepared for, ready to take on, um, and and advocated for as a result of my participation in the ERG. Um, I'd also like to highlight here too that the three of our board members um, this year were, were award winners at the Bay of Conference of the uh, Black Engineer of the Year Awards. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to, to not only prepare people for things just within the ERG, but they're translating those skill sets back into their professional nine to five jobs. So um, we recently received those awards in Washington, D.C. It was a great opportunity to, to get <laughs> to be recognized for our professional things outside of the ERG world. But I can say it, certainly as I was drafting my, my packet um, to, to be nominated for that, a lot of it was, hey, I led this team or I worked with this budget or I started this initiative or worked with this executive as a direct result of, of my participation in the ERG. So immensely thankful for the opportunity that I've had there. Yeah. 
That's I love how both of you used the word advocate um, mm -hmm. in several times during your, your situation. We actually have a topic on this, uh, a training on this, or not a training, but a, 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 a segment on, on advocacy and, and, at, and, tr and being that agent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the experiences you, you've mentioned really highlight that, right? Like being part of this ERG, you're able to advocate not just for yourself, but for others mm -hmm. as well. And as a result, new positions, new opportunities, <laughs> like it just comes, right? So kudos to y'all for, for doing that for each other. I think that's that's where you can start seeing the impact for other ERG leaders be like, why would I want to sign up for that, yes. right? Because yes. like I have yes. a day job, I'm already busy as it is, what's, the, what's in it for me, right? right? I think right. you mentioned that in a previous episode as well. Um, how is your ERG experience resistance and how have you overcome those types of obstacles? Oh man. Uh, resistance, <laughs> resistance comes in many forms. So as I'm just like flashing back through times where people, uh, people are maybe doubtful or um, were hesitant to support the different things that we have going on. I, I just want to circle back to something we talked about earlier. Success breeds, you know, confidence and 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 other um, opportunities. I think what we've done a good job of is handling the small things first and being successful in that. Whether that's how we built up our board, our organizational abilities, um, and, and our ability to communicate our, clearly our goals and objectives. And I think success in that then builds confidence and builds um, you know, opportunities for us to continue to challenge folks. So, hey, we were able to accomplish this, we're moving on this task, here's our track record. But um, there's always doubt, there's always people that, that don't think that you can get the job done. Um, continue just being successful in, in the small things and then that'll kind of open the doors for, for more things later. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with everything you said. I, I wanted to point out some specific things that I think are pretty interesting that came as a result of uh, us continuing to do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it started with us. I think it started with the high level of excellence that you know uh, we talked about Deborah Curry, yes. what she did yeah. uh, with the uh, organization beforehand. Um, but it's allowed us to be in a lot of really interesting situations. And we've developed trust with the organization mm -hmm. because of the things that we've been doing and the, and the high level of excellence we continue to, to display. Um, I, would, I would flash back to you know, some of the, the, the George Floyd situations mm -hmm. or some of the, uh, when there was a, I mean, when we were going through the, the time where there was a lot of Asian hate uh, mm -hmm. occurring. Um, interestingly enough, because of the things that, because of the strong force we've been, um, we've been able to kind of help the organization tackle those situations. Mm -hmm. They bring us in as thought partners to say, hey, this is your community. We want to make sure we're doing, we're saying the right things. We're being a part of this, this movement in the right way. How can we do that? So I think that's something that you, you kind of develop yeah. uh, as, you, as you continue to be a, a great organization is that, that level of trust yeah. that allows you to move through those complicated situations together um, instead of us trying to find this, having this friction against each other. Of, yeah. I think you should be doing this. And they're like, we don't want to do that. <laughs> I, yeah. oh, I, I, think, I think too as well that there's been, that you have to have confidence in your messaging because mm -hmm. I, I, now that you're bringing those up, I'm remembering specific points where we wanted to have conversations around black hair in the workplace. We recently mm -hmm. had those or conversations and discussions around uh, HBCU students versus PWI students mm -hmm. um, or even just having conversations with executives on like, how are we handling those situations? There, I, in all of those instances, there were folks that were not confident in uh, in our ability to handle those conversa conversations. Mm -hmm. There were also people who didn't think we needed to have those conversations mm -hmm. in the first place. They did not think that they were necessary, um, and it just kind of took a, um, a, a hard headedness. I don't have a better word than that yeah. <laughs> for us to resilience. say resilience. Yeah, okay. yes, resilience. Resilience yes. is great. Yeah, <laughs> resilience and and the fact that hey, these are things that we not only have experience, but are being echoed by different communities. And we feel like in order to do our jobs and represent um, that community effectively, we have to press forward in the face of those. So just a little bit of resiliency. Mm -hmm. I like that word a lot there. Or persistence, <laughs> maybe. Persistence, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And in the face of that adversity in order to get it done was, was another thing that I remember. And I'd like to, sorry, just yeah, <laughs> one more yeah. on top of that, because I think that's a really good uh, situation that we kind of work through. Being hard headed is good, but don't be, uh, make sure you're still malleable. Yes, yes Make yes, sure you yes. can adapt to the situation as it requires. So for instance, uh, when we're talking about the, the HBCU versus PWI conversation that and, we want to And tell to people have. what PWI, just in case they don't know. Predominantly white uh, institution. Institution. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Correct. Which is a uh, pretty, co pretty common term on, on HBCUs, but I don't think the other side hears that yeah. a lot. 
Um, but it was so important for us to have that conversation. And we had a lot of pushback specifically about PWS. It's good that you brought that up yeah. um, because there was a, a sense that that evoked a negative connotation. Um, that just the term? The, just, yeah. just the term, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we were actually given pushback on just the term PWI, and we said, it's not a negative thing, that's just it's the, op the opposite the the way you describe it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, 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 the other party felt so strongly about that, that they were like, you know, I just don't, I don't like the way that, so what we had to do was we said, okay, that's, that's okay. Right. We can work with that. So what we did was we changed the title of the Correct. event. Yeah. But we still delivered the content that we thought was necessary because we, we expressed to them the importance of still having that conversation. Right. right. But if but we we understood if some people were gonna take that the wrong way, yeah. all right, let's let's make it something that's a little bit easier for people to palate. That's fine. Um, but let's still have this conversation. Because ultimately we want everybody to be included in the exactly. conversation. And I think that the folks that may have had hesitations around even those terms are the folks that I want to mm -hmm. bring into that yeah. conversation. Exactly, exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's so important because if you know that there's a certain trigger, there's a word, there's a yeah. phrase, mm -hmm. and people can't mentally get past that to even have the conversation, mm -hmm. yes. then pivot. Yes. Yeah. Pivot so that they yeah. can remove that roadblock so you can have the open mm -hmm. conversation. So I love that. Yes. Yeah. Y'all about to make me <laughs> throw my sheet of paper. I mean, and no more questions. No. <laughs> because I was hoping, and y'all did it just flawlessly, but I was hoping you all would talk about this, the, the ability to develop situational leadership mm -hmm. as ERG leaders, right? Holding true to the message. So no one's saying be uh, disingenuous mm -hmm. or inauthentic, but adapting a message is just a leadership skill. Mm -hmm. But I would say in particular for underrepresented communities, it's usually a skill that we have to really hone and fine tune to a higher degree. So did anything, uh, just maybe kind of quickly, what sort of helps you get there? How did you kind of learn how to shift, downshift to be able to go into a higher <laughs> gear? Like what did you what did you learn or what can you share? Oh man, I don't know if it's a, so I think it's something that we've done naturally, which yeah. is unfortunate because we don't really have the, yeah. the contact. They're so good, that's but, what they're saying. They're yeah. <laughs> I, I say we, we, it's, one of our, it's one of our strengths is being able to adapt. And I think that, that just comes from our backgrounds individually. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we've often had to adapt to different situations, often had to adapt um, in order to be successful. And so that's just like another uh, tool in the tool belt that you, you pick up along the road of life. I don't think either one of us have ever been in a situation where our full intent or full messaging has been, the way we wanted to present it initially has been the palatable version of mm -hmm. it. And so in order to just be effective, you, you have to learn how to downshift and, and move around roadblocks and identify what people's roadblocks are in the first place and then still be welcoming in that. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't know, I don't have a, a good... <laughs> so I would say for me personally, I think the, the tenet that helps me stay true on this topic specifically is empathy. Oh yeah, that's good. I think whenever I come to conversations, whenever I have conversations with leaders, what I'm always trying to do is I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. Yeah. Okay? And for instance, when we're having conversations where there is a trigger word mm -hmm. um, or something that's really bothering them, I think about it from my perspective. Okay, mm -hmm. I've been in situations where people have said a word that I'm like, mm -hmm. that, I, mm, I really can't yeah. grapple with anything else you're saying because that <laughs> word is really getting to me. Right yes. there, yeah. um, so in those, in those, uh, in all those situations, I think if you bring a level of empathy to the other with the other person to all of those things, you will naturally develop that talent. Yeah. You will start to sharpen it. You will start to hone it. Yeah. And when you think about it, reflect on your conversations. Reflect yes. on the on the conversations and and the ways that events went, or did I get my message across, or how did this you know go? Because if you reflect on it, you once again you continue to get better at at yeah. being able to empathize with somebody. Wow. Yeah. That's so powerful. Okay, I'm gonna try to squeeze this in really quick and then I'll get, I promise I'll get to my question. We often hear, um, and even recently, um, our team was facilitating a session with a group of leaders, um, very operational driven leaders. And we were having the conversation of how do you apply a diversity lens to talent development and even talent selection. And the the tone or the prevailing mindset of this group of leaders, almost 50 leaders of this organization was like, well, I don't consider diversity. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't, right? You know, like, 
I just hire the best or mm -hmm. I just go off of the qualifications. I don't I don't need to see someone's color and I shouldn't see someone's color. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what you just talked about around often underrepresented communities or communities who have been marginalized or discounted historically often have to learn the adaptive skills that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. And you literally said, I don't really know, it just comes naturally. I don't know how we're doing it, it just comes naturally. Well, you've probably been doing it most of your life. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yes, now in your professional life, it feels natural, mm -hmm. but this has likely culturally been developed over decades, mm -hmm. right? I won't say how many decades, because I know y'all yell. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I just, I think I want to just highlight that because we hear it often. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't look at someone's color or gender or who they love or that doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, no, that person's life experiences have shaped the person mm -hmm. that is likely sitting across from you that you are currently considering for an opportunity mm -hmm. and to discount their identities mm -hmm. means you are discounting all of the rich leadership skills and different kind of innovative ideas and creativity that they can bring to the organization. So I just couldn't let that go, but mm -hmm. I feel like you got something you want to say. I just, I'm yeah. very, no, I just, <laughs> I'm so passionate about that particular phrase of, of people saying, I don't see, or I don't recognize, or I don't feel like I need to. Um, and I find in, in my history, a lot of those times, especially when you're in corporate America, people want to tie it to dollars and cents. And so what I like to tell people is that the more you ignore, the, the less return on investment you're getting. If you are discounting that person's experience, background, um, whatever their day-to-day their -day life is, you are paying them but not reaping the full benefits of their skill set, what happens to them in their background. Um, I, for example, I think one of the biggest uh, advantages that I've had for somebody who, I'll go back to someone who's in the military. So I work in engineering, we build uh, things on a computer all day. It's great, we have a lot of fun, we play with our little toys at our desks. <laughs> one, of the th one of the things that helps us out tremendously is having folks who had to maintain those aircraft uh, sit with us on a day-to-day -day basis. And they tell us consistently, you cannot build that, it, it will not work. Um, and that person's experience in the military is not something that you can say like, oh, I put that on my resume, I'm a military guy, I know exactly how this works. But if you hire that person blind of their personal experience, then you are losing out on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Additionally, I've also had opportunities where folks uh, have been a part of, uh, it was kind of like a, a hybrid HR uh, slash engineering group. This is in mm -hmm. a previous role, not, not at Bell. Uh, and they took a, a diverse team of folks out there with them and the folks that were recruiting, the folks that were looking at these opportunities were like, hey, why are we not having success in, at these particular schools or in these particular communities? And uh, that's because you got <laughs> that, those, so I'm trying to be as, as vague mm. as possible, but <laughs> there, were, there were folks of African-American descent on that team who were being more successful than some of their counterparts. And that's because they were naturally looking at that person's, the, the folks that they were trying to recruit, their full experience. Um, and they were able to relate more personally to them. And they were having more successful, more callbacks, more interactions. These folks felt more comfortable in, in their presence. Um, and I just, I, I think that if you don't bring who your full self is into the role, you're missing out on on so much. I, mm -hmm. I could talk about it at length, so I'm trying to keep it. I know, I know. This is, y'all are coming back. This is a whole new episode. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, y'all Because I can back. actually also explain probably why there's some of those mindsets from just, you know, from what uh, I've yeah. seen mm -hmm. in what I do and, and very those uh, very operational minds are just thinking, well, the law says I shouldn't discriminate, so I'm not going to see, right? right. And yeah, so that's right, yeah. the common, mm -hmm. uh, they, they probably don't have bad intentions. Of it's course. just they're not recognizing the full, right. the full scope of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and I agree. That's a good call out, Annalise. I think that there are people who have good intentions, you know, you know, saying, considering themselves to be colorblind, for example, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an expression we hear, likely comes initially from a good intended place, mm -hmm. well-intended place but not recognizing the, the impact of, of that, right? And so it is an educational opportunity, just yeah. as Cortland has reminded us. Um, but 
you all are amazing and we 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 like y'all just <laughs> we didn't even get to all the questions again because y'all are just bringing up all these fire topics and conversations but um thank you for your leadership and thank you for how you are influencing and impacting so many people and yourselves mm -hmm. along the way um so i i don't know i don't i, I don't even want to ask another question because nope, then we'll good. be here another hour <laughs> <laughs> all right well as very it's very clear that this is an amazing conversation well beyond employee resource groups and i hope that you will subscribe to 24 Karis podcast share this episode in particular as it relates to developing talent that is often underrepresented in so many organizations such great words of wisdom and perspective that we were able to share here thanks to tony and Cortland from bell's bang employee resource group until next time, we'll see you soon.